Welcome to Stanford Sustainable Finance and Investment Seminar. My name is So Young In, and I'm a host for the seminar series. I'm a, a faculty member at the uh, Korea Advanced Institute for Science and Technology, KAIST, uh, and then also affiliated fellow at the Stanford Center for Sustainable Development and Global Competitiveness. Uh, this monthly seminar series uh, is actually collective, um, collaborative uh, effort between Stanford uh, Sustainable Finance Initiative, SFI, and KAIST uh, Graduate School on Green Growth and Sustainability. So each month, we will explore a wide range of topics in sustainable finance and investment. And then we are delighted to have you all here as our audience continues to grow globally. So before we begin, I have some uh, notes on the logistics. So we are having bigger audience. So please ensure your microphone is muted during the talk. And if you have any questions, please use, use your chat window where Alicia here, uh, our managing director at SFI will be monitoring. So uh, we won't miss you out. So, it's now our pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Peter Fried. Peter is a uh, research fellow at Stanford SFI, Sustainable Finance Initiative. He has over 20 years of experience at intersection of clean energy and climate, advising companies, investors on optimizing uh, both business performance and uh, climate outcomes. Peter was the director of energy strategy at Meta and also a founding board member of the Clean Energy Buyers Alliance. Uh, so today he will be sharing about uh, his insight on Plan C, Rethinking cl Corporate Climate Commitment. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Peter Fried. Welcome, Peter. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here and, and having an opportunity to talk about this with you all. Um, as So Young said, uh, you know, this is a, a large group, but in spite of the fact that I signed up to to give a lecture, I actually hate lecturing. So um, it's hard to to sort of engender that dynamic environment that we might have if we were all together. But please do put questions into the chat, comments, et cetera. And Alicia Seiger, the managing director of the program, who has been uh, a comrade and compatriot in developing all of this thinking uh, over the course of the last several years, can sort of help collate and, and drive at least a little bit of conversation as we move along. So um, I'd encourage everyone uh, to go ahead and, and do that. Um, look, I, let me just start by saying, you know, you heard my background. Um, it's really a pleasure to be at the Sustainable Finance Initiative um, and at Stanford working on this stuff. I spent 10 years at Meta as the lead on energy strategy and a number of years before that working in energy, climate, corporate sustainability and a host of things. Um, and a lot of what uh, has informed my thinking around this proposal that we're going to be talking about today is really that experience of working inside of companies and that practitioner's perspective, I think is a valuable contribution to this conversation, but it is also very valuable to do it inside of the academic setting here at Stanford to really think some of those big ideas that just don't happen when you've got a day job. So it's, um, it's really exciting to be here and to be thinking about this. Um, it's probably going to be important before we get into what Plan C is to talk a little bit about the current state of, the, of affairs in, in terms of the world of corporate greenhouse gas uh, accounting and corporate climate strategies, um, because much of the thinking that we're doing is informed by sort of flaws and challenges with the current system. And the truth is, we could spend the entire time talking about that, and I'm going to try to be relatively brief on it, but I think that some framing of kind of how the world works today will be useful in better understanding how the world might work better in the future. So that said, where are we today? First and foremost, it is sort of generally accepted, the general wisdom is that companies and the private sector have a meaningful role to play in fighting climate change. So we're not going to we're not going to dive into whether that's correct or not. But let's let's start from there. And over the years, let's call it the last 15 plus years, um, 
this approach of using the private sector to sort of engage in fighting climate change, particularly through voluntary action, has settled into a framework that we at SFI think of as the inventory intervention and claims framework, which informs functionally all voluntary corporate climate commitments that are being acted on and made today. Um, the most well known of those, probably the most notable is net zero. And thousands of companies have now signed up uh, under the science-based target initiative with some flavor or another of net zero commitment. So um, not knowing exactly how much background everybody in the audience has, I'm gonna spend a few minutes just sort of talking about this inventory intervention and claims framework as it works today. And then we can talk about some of the issues with that and ultimately some of the alternatives that we've been thinking about. So first and foremost, what is an inventory? So an inventory is some measure of the emissions associated with running a business. And it's divided into what we call three scopes. So scope one is a company's direct emissions. That's pretty easy to understand if you are burning natural gas in a boiler at your office building, uh, if you have a generator that is running to keep your facility online, it's the diesel fuel that you might be burning there. Um, it's really everything that is directly attributable to your business. Scope two is the indirect emissions associated with your electricity consumption. So. Many, many businesses, probably all businesses, have some electricity that they're using, some much more than others. Certainly my former employer, Meta, used a lot of electricity in its data centers. And so scope two is this broad conversation around how we think about the emissions impacts associated with electricity use. And then finally, scope three is probably the hardest to wrap your head around, but it basically says, okay, Let's look at your entire supply chain or value chain. All of the companies that are supplying you, the companies that supply them, what are the emissions associated with all of that activity? Some of the more common ones that people think about are like employee travel. So if you've got employees that are flying around on airplanes, uh, there are emissions associated with that. That would fall inside of scope three. But it could also be things like shipping. It's a lot of what we would call embedded emissions inside of products and services. So if you are using uh, you know, a widget to manufacture a product, what is the energy use that went into making that widget? All of these things go into scope three. And as you might imagine, it becomes very, very complicated uh, and also very broad. Uh, and as a result, one of the things that happens is that companies understand scope one particularly well, because that's really stuff where you're going to have invoices, meters, that sort of thing. Scope two, I think most companies understand relatively well, at least in terms of what their electricity consumption is, because they're usually receiving a bill for it. And then finally, for scope three, which is like this whole value chain thing, that is where we really get into a world of uh, increasingly various estimates. And not only are those estimates getting more and more significant, but also the scope is getting larger. So for most companies, uh, their scope three is significantly larger than their scope one and often larger than their scope two, depending on sort of the nature of the business. And when you add all of those things together, that is your inventory, at least under sort of current frameworks. Greenhouse gas protocol, GHGP, is kind of the most common accounting standard that is used for figuring out how to create such an inventory. And it's been in use in one form or another for, for more than 10 years, um, you know, going back quite some time. And uh, that informs the inventory part of the equation. So then the next piece of it is, well, what do you do about that? And that's really where we start thinking about what we might call interventions. And so interventions similarly can map across scopes. So inside of scope one, these would be direct reductions in your direct emissions. So if you are using uh, an old fuel oil powered boiler, you could upgrade to uh, a newer, more efficient gas fired boiler, and that would be a direct reduction in your emissions. You could also interestingly switch to an electric powered boiler, maybe a heat pump of some sort, and that would shift your scope one emissions into some new scope two emissions. And it gets a little bit complicated, but you get the idea. Um, inside of scope two, 
two things are typically happening with companies. First of all, you can obviously through energy efficiency and other means reduce your electricity consumption. And this is where all of the corporate renewable energy commitments that many of you are likely familiar with come into play. This would be things like RE100 or ultimately the net zero commitment as well, where you are working with renewable energy or clean energy projects, which aren't necessarily on site to help bring down the emissions impact associated with your scope two. And then finally, we get to scope three, where this gets really, really tricky because of the diversity of, of things that fall into the scope. There are a wide variety of interventions that a company could undertake. Some of them are relatively straightforward. So for example, if you know that you have materials with a high amount of embedded emissions, you could use less of those materials. That's sort of a fundamental efficiency concept. Uh, you can also use things for longer. This is sort of circularity and some of these other extending product useful lives. Some of that's pretty straightforward. Other times, definitively not. So some of the examples that I tend to like to think about are you're a facility, you're a company that owns a facility that has a lot of wiring, a lot of copper wires in that facility. You would be expected to have some notional intervention to address the emissions associated with copper wiring, which will drive you towards trying to figure out something to do in the world of copper mining. And if you're a tech company, for example, with a data center that has copper wires in it, what in the world do you know about copper mining? The answer is very little. There are also companies who have somewhere back in the supply chain some exposure to land use. And I was once on a panel with, with a really great person at another company who had just hired a soil scientist. This was not an agricultural company to help them think through the impacts associated with soil carbon and land use. And so one of the things that happens here is that we begin to see significant inefficiencies in the system. First of all, even in the more straightforward scopes like scope one, the marginal abatement cost curve which again, hopefully most of the folks here know what we're talking about, but marginal abatement cost is essentially the cost of an intervention from the perspective of, of dollars per ton of emissions reductions. The marginal abatement cost curve on an intervention in scope one can be quite steep. So, you know, maybe it's relatively simple to insulate a building and therefore use less gas heating, that sort of thing. But one finds as you get closer to the end of scope one, and this is just based on my experience working with a lot of companies doing it over the years, is that as you get closer to the edges, those interventions get really, really expensive. And there's a good question there about whether that's really the right place to spend corporate money from the perspective of climate impact, which isn't to say don't spend the money. It's just to say, is this the highest and best use of an intervention? More importantly, as we get to scope three, it really begs some very interesting questions about why we're doing any of this in the first place, because we are disaggregating a problem on the basis of things that happen to end up in your supply chain, rather than focusing the solutions to the problems on interventions which drive the, which drive the highest impact. So any given company with any sort of moderately robust or complicated supply chain might be pointed in the direction of hundreds of different interventions because they happen to have some exposure to it. Concrete, mining, shipping, air travel. Like, how is a company whose expertise is data centers or whose expertise is warehouses or whose expertise is real estate supposed to have a good solution to any of these problems? And so this is one of the fundamental issues with the current system is that we have disaggregated the solution to the problem and also disaggregated the solution set so that we have thousands and thousands of companies working on hundreds and hundreds of things without any consideration both to maximizing climate impact and also without any consideration given to the expertise and capability of the companies who we are asking to act. This is a deeply, deeply flawed situation. Um, then we get to the last piece of the puzzle, which is the claims piece. So we talked about net zero is kind of the most common claim that people are making today. And the first thing I just want to say as a practitioner in the space of the thousands and thousands of companies that have set net zero goals, 
it is a much, much smaller handful who have actually looked at a strategy that would take them from wherever it is they are today in their emissions profile to a true net zero state. And what you find, and there is documented evidence on this, is that it is impossible within the bounds of physical and financial reality to reduce your emissions to net zero. It can't be done. And so that in and of itself is a real problem. And there are a lot of very smart people who are working to try to figure some of this out. But even with the interventions that are available and could get us there one way or another using project-based interventions and removals and some of these things, the framework of guidance that informs what companies can do and what can't, can't do is very spotty. And there are real challenges around both project volumes and types of projects and fundamentally about the cost of intervention. So we find ourselves in an interesting world. And at the same time, and very importantly, there are many, many companies who are today spending real and meaningful quantities of money in good faith to try to meet these goals. The problem is the frameworks in which they are operating don't create efficient action from either a climate or cost perspective. Additionally, when you add in the complexity of these systems, along with companies' concerns about being caught on the wrong side of a standards change, because these standards are in the process of being reformed and changed and all of these things, like many companies are just sitting on the sidelines, waiting to see what's going to happen. Greenhouse gas protocol, as I mentioned, is sort of the, one of the most common standards that's being used. Their deadline for their protocol revision kind of keeps slipping back. And so many companies are just saying, like, we're going to wait and see. And so as a result, what happens is that a lot of good and smart people are working to make this system better. And I want to recognize the importance of that work. These are people who are former colleagues of mine, people that I've worked with, the folks at SFI and others. A lot of people recognize the importance of this, although, to be fair, it's a pretty small constituency of folks that spend their day jobs thinking about this stuff um, who are trying to make it better. And so we've created a very simple framework for thinking about the types of interventions. And this is how we're going to get to plan C. So before I get into that, just as we've talked a little bit about the framing background, I do want to just pause and see whether anything has come in. Alicia, if we've got anything that we might want to talk about here before we jump into the framing of plan A, plan B, and plan C. Before I know that this excitement is coming, but uh, before then, you know, like now that we are talking about the basic, uh, you know, like it's very interesting to, you know, like you framed, you know, like our capabilities and so on. Um, maybe this is more like a basic understanding question, the challenges of the interventions in terms of the capability. How are you thinking that, you know, large or resource rich companies versus, you know, like other small and medium sized companies, you know, like uh, are they in the similar or totally different situation in terms of, you know, like uh, intervention capability or how they are approaching this differently? Yeah, I, I would say, sort of radically different, but both struggling with the same things. So anyone that's gone through the business of trying to do the inventory is finding that they have exposures to all of these different parts of the economy. So large, well-resourced companies with sophisticated teams are the ones who, again, in good, in good faith, spending real money, trying to figure out how to do things in, like I said, copper mining, mitigating industrial gas leakage in the manufacture of uh, semiconductors. Like, you know, these are people whose day job isn't that. Um, if you are at a smaller, medium-sized company without those kinds of resources or the large and well-resourced teams, for the most part, the companies that I'm aware of, they're just not touching that. First of all, net zero is very difficult across all of the scopes. So many of them are just saying, all right, we'll work on scope one and scope two for now we'll do the parts of scope three that feel more straightforward. Like we'll, we'll encourage our employees to travel less, you know, like that's a very common scope three intervention. Um, but getting into those, those deeper supply chain things, like for the most part, people are just sitting on the sidelines because they either don't have the resources or they don't know what to do. And, you know, frankly, even the ones that do have the resources, I will tell you from my own experience, going out into the world and trying to have conversations with mining companies with semiconductor manufacturers, with shipping companies, a lot of them are like, 
we don't know what you're talking about. You know, like it is, there's a huge disconnect across the entire supply chain about how the intervention should work. So it's a, it's a great question. No, no one has figured this out. People are, are trying to muddle through. Talking about the capability, you know, this is a capability of taking actions. And then also the other capability is actually reporting or communicating about what they're doing. And then uh, how you're seeing that, you know, this, you know, capability of communicating or reporting, you know, like those, you know, actions, at least, you know, like the willingness to take actions. I mean, it's not the willingness to take the actions, you know, like these efforts on our performance, you know, how are they doing or are they struggle too? And then also this struggle, become different again in the resource reach or large companies versus others. Yeah. Um, I think generally speaking for most companies, there's a large willingness to try and disclose. There's a diversity and lack of guidance in terms of how to disclose. So, you know, for example, SPTI, the leading net zero framework does not have interim progress baked into the system, nor does it have a mechanism for progress tracking and reporting. What do you do in absence of clear guidance when the when the goal that you have set, what do you do in absence of guidance from the goal setter to figure out how to report that? Similarly, greenhouse gas protocol is in the middle of this revision process. So we have a lot of companies that are reporting on the old version of the protocol or not at all because they have challenges in terms of making the data all work. So I think companies do, generally speaking, report where they can they want to report, it can be challenging to figure out how to report on some things. My personal perspective is that actually in this environment, this is, you know, any company that's on the line, I actually think radical transparency is the answer here, which is just to say, here's what we're doing. Here's why we're doing it. It's substantiated based on the following facts. Here's where we're making assumptions. If there are better facts or assumptions that maybe members of this particular community that's all on the phone today could help us with, we'd love to do that and we'll change when there's better information. But I think all of that is something that feels relatively chaotic, which actually is a pretty good segue into this like plan A, plan B, plan C. So as we think about the world as it is today, where are people sort of looking at the system and trying to create fixes? So the first is what we call plan A which is basically taking the same frameworks that we're in, the existing standards, the existing goal setting, the existing claims frameworks, and essentially trying to apply patches to it to make them work better. And frankly, this is a very worthwhile exercise because the system that we're in today actually has quite a lot of inertia behind it. And there's a reasonable chance that this is the system that we're gonna have. And so I think it is worthwhile to try to make it better. That said, it remains unclear whether we will ever have a plan A system that has achievable targets. And I can see no world in which there is one where impact from a climate perspective is the thing which is being maximized for all of the reasons that we've just discussed. Plan B then is sort of the next level up. And in my conception, plan B is where you're still following sort of this inventory intervention claims framework but you give it a more serious overhaul. So maybe you take some of the pieces and you rebuild them from the ground up. Maybe you bake in a system of progress tracking. Maybe you have goals that companies can actually hit, which I think in the long run is certainly admirable and important if we could get there, but you still end up with a system where you are disaggregating problem solving and resourcing across those same thousands of actors and hundreds of interventions with minimal coordination and very little thought given to maximizing impact. So that's where we kind of get to plan C. And I would say there are a lot of people both working on plan A and plan B today, and they are doing good and admirable work. And in fact, wherever I can, I try to encourage and help in those actions. But I also think it is instructive and useful to imagine an entirely different path. And if I'm thinking in the simplest terms, the goal of Plan C is providing a pathway to ensure that the leading companies are able to optimize their climate spending for impact, while you are also lowering barriers of entry for more companies to sort of get off the bench and get involved. So, Peter, can I interrupt you, sir? There's a question coming up in the chat that I think is worth touching on, which is just kind of the different jurisdictional approaches and in light of the EU taxonomy, how, how do you think about the kind of separation of leaders and laggers or expectations across different domestic 
jurisdictions of corporate headquarters. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I think it is generally worth recognizing that um, much of the much of what we're talking about is still existing inside of voluntary markets. And it will be interesting to see whether there are portions, what and which pieces of this world end up in, in regulated or legal frameworks. We are, of course, seeing mandatory disclosure requirements both internationally and in the United States, subject to a wide variety of litigation, um, as one might expect in domestic markets. Um, but I do think... Uh, a lot of what we're talking about here is probably well suited to beginning in a voluntary context and then seeing where it goes elsewhere. We could spend a longer time probably talking about sort of the impacts and challenges of taking tools that were developed inside of a voluntary framework and trying to apply them in a legal and regulatory context for a purpose that they were not designed for. Um, and I'm not going to go down that particular rabbit hole right now, but I do have deep concerns that some of these voluntary structures will likely collapse under the weight of the regulatory burden. Um, we'll save that for another, yeah. another conversation in another day. Great. Sorry to interrupt, but that's my job. Please. Not please. at all. That was great. <laughs> so that then brings us to plan C, as we've said, as we've said, and the first thing I want to say about plan C is just to recognize, lest anyone get excited, that it is a concept. And it is a concept which is still in development. But one of the things that I believe strongly is that as we are thinking about these big ideas, if we don't get them down on paper, if we don't fully flesh them out, even if they, as the thing that they will be in sort of the ideal state, will never make its way into a law or a framework or a program, we also will never be able to have a real conversation about the advantages that some of these new ideas might bring and highlight some of the key problems with the system that we have today. So as we are thinking about Plan C at SFI and thinking about Plan C more broadly, that's sort of the idea here is to flesh out this idea in its entirety from an ideal state perspective. And then there's a really fun set of work, I think the more important and interesting work where you sort of beg, borrow and steal pieces of it to insert into voluntary framework A, regulatory framework B, et cetera, et cetera. So we're in the early days and we're excited to tell you about it, but there's a lot of work that's left to be done. So um, that then is the framing. What is plan C? I think about it in a very, very simple way as the following. How do we collect an appropriate amount of money from companies and then efficiently direct that money at interventions which are most likely to reduce atmospheric carbon flux at the greatest scale and speed. And this is like first principle stuff. Because I think if you were to look at the existing net, free, net zero framework and voluntary corporate climate commitments that you have today, and you acknowledge that companies are already spending a lot of money on this, and then you went and asked very smart people, many of whom are likely on this call, how you could most efficiently spend that money fighting climate change, there is no universe in which the system that you would come up with is the current net zero framework. And so this is sort of what we're trying to get at here. Um, I was describing this to a friend of mine, and she said, look, I think I get it, right? It's the companies are already feeling the pain associated with this. So it's not about lessening the pain. It's about increasing the impact associated with it for climate. I was like, yeah, that's right. And if along the way we can get it simple enough that we can bring more folks off of the sidelines and increase the pool of money, then that would be also a significant benefit associated with the system. So if that is the thing that we are trying to do, there are really two big and important questions. The first is how much, how big a check do companies need to write? And then the second is what do you spend it on? And at the heart of it, those, those are the fundamental pieces of, of, of Plan C. And we've got some ideas about both of them. But ultimately, the notion of the check size should be tied back to making sure the companies are paying their fair share, whatever it is. There is some notional responsibility from being a corporate entity in the world associated with climate change. And so we need to make sure that the check that they are writing is their fair share relative to solving the problem. And there's a number of different answers to this. Most of them involve 
using estimates of emissions, which by the way, we are already using across the existing systems, likely adjusted for conservativeness, and then transformed into dollars through some price on carbon. And you could probably do this in a number of ways. You could imagine applying an emissions factor to a revenue of a company, which by the way is how a significant majority of scope three accounting happens today. EEIO is the, the name of that approach. And because there is so little data available across supply chains, many, many companies, in fact, most companies reporting on scope three today are just taking their revenue and, and multiplying it by a sector specific emissions factor. Um, you could also imagine a negotiated number. There are pluses and minuses to all of these approaches, but it's a possibility. Uh, finally, you can imagine back calculation based on the amount of money that you wanted to deploy, just simply divided by the number of companies that you would like to participate in the program. So there are different ways to get to it, but one of the things that feels very important to this is that we not mistake accuracy for conservativeness. And so accuracy in the case of much of this stuff, for all of the reasons we've just discussed, is likely fantasy-like in many of these cases. We simply won't have the data. We can accept this and we can address it through being as conservative as possible, using conservativeness factors, and move on. The point is that we need to make sure that no, if we're thinking about the emissions associated with a given company, that we err on the side of representing that a given company has more emissions than they actually have, rather than fewer. It doesn't need to be rocket science necessarily, although there is certainly plenty of devil in the details. However, we've also been spending time today talking and thinking about more sophisticated and less sophisticated companies. And actually, this is a, I'm so glad that that was brought up because there will be a constituency of companies for whom taking that sort of estimated conservative approach might not make sense for a variety of reasons. And so this is a little idea. We borrowed it from the US tax code. We call it the standardized and itemized deduction. So if the notion of the standardized deduction is, all right, you want to take the relatively simple, the relatively simple and less expensive to get to sort of the answer path, you can do that. And we will be conservative in assessing the dollar number. On the other hand, if you are a large and sophisticated company with the resources to do it, there are also pathways to do a much more detailed study and analysis of your associated emissions. And if you design the system in the right way, there should be incentives within that system for you to make those reductions. So if you have the wherewithal to make reductions inside of the inventory and you have the resources to figure out where those emissions are coming from, there can be a pathway to do that, which can incentivize emissions reductions, particularly for very large emitters, large scope one emitters in particular, you could imagine having an interest in doing something like this. But the point is there's flexibility and optionality for companies. Um, we ultimately need to make sure that we remember that these companies are already spending millions, actually probably billions of dollars on this today. And so one of the things that sometimes people say is like, hey, hey, you know, we need to we need to pause and we're thinking about a future state. And it's it this isn't that, right? What this is is figuring out how to make sure that we feel like the check sizes are right and then that the checks are being used to maximize impact. So it's not trying to make it hurt less financially. It's trying to increase the climate impact, the climate efficiency of the way that you're spending the money. Peter, um, I interrupt you again yeah. while you're on the topic of money. Uh, there's a question in the chat, hi, Juan. Uh, about pricing uh, mechanisms to determine the, the how much and, and whether there's a relationship between the carbon pricing schemes, ETS, carb, direct carbon tax, how you're thinking about that as a reference point. Yeah, I mean, look, I think there are a number of different places that you could 
pull from, but I also don't want to dis. I mean, I said it in a little bit of a, a flip way, but actually, I, I don't want to discount the the power of just a negotiated number. Um, you know, uh, it would be great to think about the social cost of carbon. You could pull it from an ETS. You could call it. You know, you could pull it from any number of places. Um, but it may also be particularly in a voluntary context that the right number means that functionally to participate in a plan C program, the cost of participation is at or maybe just slightly below what at least the largest and leading companies are already paying to meet net zero. Um, and in that case, that would be a negotiated number. So I think this is one of the things as you begin to think about like how you take an idea and translate it through into the real world through the lens of political economy, where you're beginning to think about sort of the dynamics associated with each of those. And I do really want to reiterate that the way you would think about that within a voluntary context is meaningfully different than the way you would think about it if an element of this was ever pulled into a regulatory or, or, or legal framework where you need you would then need to make sure that all of it is fitting together and rolling up to the top line goal of the program. The last thing to say on the check, and maybe in some ways the most important thing, is that for companies, once the check is written, you're done. That is the full extent of your responsibility to the program. And we're going to talk about the reasons for this in a second. But ultimately, one of the biggest flaws in the current system, let's just keep using this copper mining example of mine. If you are a tech company that is trying to figure out what to do in copper mining, because there are wires in your data centers, how can you possibly be held accountable to whether those copper mining projects work or not? How can you be held accountable to figuring out whether the copper mining project which you have chosen is the right copper mining project? That's the breakdown. And so one of the things about Plan C is we shift the burden of responsibility for efficacy onto the entities that are responsible for acting, which brings us to how to spend the money. So it's probably clear at this point that one of the things that I find most problematic with the current system is we have way too many interventions. And so one of the sort of thought exercises associated with Plan C is what if we take hundreds and hundreds of interventions and make it three to five and take all of the money that we've collected and just direct it at three to five? This actually isn't that hard to do because we have a lot of useful tools to tell us how to do that. The IPCC Global Mac Curve. Actually, most of the folks here probably know what the things are. It's energy, it's transportation, it's buildings, it's agriculture, it's land use. It needn't be that long a list. We work on them for some set period of time. And then you figure out whether or not it's been working and course correct is necessary. So how do we work on this stuff? This is what we've taken to calling platforms. You could maybe think about it as funds. I prefer platforms because one of the things that's sort of liberating about Plan C is that it needn't just be about deploying capital for the purposes of generating returns, you know, financial returns or carbon returns or what have you. Um, but the notion is that the platforms become a location where you can aggregate resources, financial resources, and expertise to work on specific high impact problems. So rather than thousands of companies working on hundreds of things in an uncoordinated way, you have lots and lots of money going into a platform to work on a specific challenge with the core focus around maximizing actually whatever you want. So it, it may be climate impact, but you could also theoretically design a platform that was focused on driving decarbonization in the global south, working on environmental justice, mitigating the health impacts associated with climate change. These are not things which are readily baked into any of the net zero programs that we have today. It's, it's spawned a whole class of interesting work around things like beyond value chain interventions, which are great, except that net zero is so hard in and of itself that nobody has time or resources to work on beyond value chain. So if we want to set an ambitious target related to technology transfer, 
you can set that target and work on it directly out of the gate rather than trying to put it in around the edges. The other thing about the platform model is that the platforms themselves are held accountable for the impact. And this is important. It should be measurable. It should be verifiable. There should be targets. Ideally, the measurement should happen as close to the level of atmospheric carbon flux as possible. If the platform isn't meeting its targets, its funding will be cut and reallocated. The platform is ultimately the one holding the bag for responsibility, and we can reallocate amongst the platforms after some set period of time, either because they've been effective and they're no longer needed, or because they're not effective and we need to switch to something else. Responsibility for efficacy is now appropriately directed at the entity with the most wherewithal towards solving the problem, which is 100% not the case today. That, in a nutshell, is Plan C, a mechanism to collect money and then a mechanism to direct money at the highest impact climate interventions that we can come up with. What then comes next? And that's really sort of the fun and exciting part of this. So first of all, elements of Plan C already exist in the world today. Not exactly in the same way, but similar. So the Energy Transition Accelerator, which is a, a multi-party program, State Department, Bezos Earth Fund, but C2ES, a number of other organizations, which is focused on sectoral decarbonization in the electricity sector in emerging markets, that is a, that's a platform by another day. Frontier, the advanced market commitment for carbon removal technologies, which is aggregating demand signals along with expertise and money into a single platform to go out and try to move the carbon removal market forward as quickly as possible and faster than it would happen if individual companies were doing it on their own, is also functionally a platform. So we kind of have some ideas. There are more examples of this. We have some ideas uh, of things that look like this already. Also, and no surprise, because I've been saying it, companies are already spending the money. So this isn't necessarily about spending less money. It's just using the money we have more efficiently. Ultimately, what comes next for this idea and SFI is to flesh a bunch of this out. Get much of what we've talked about today down on paper with some more details. And then you get to dive into the more interesting pieces of how you would actually begin to implement some of this. And I will say... As I sit in various versions of plan A and plan B conversations that are happening amongst companies, amongst NGOs, amongst governments and others, as we begin to get definition around more of these plan C concepts, you don't have to squint too hard to actually already begin to see where you can pull pieces of this into those conversations to improve efficiency and maximize impact. So I actually, I believe that maybe the bridge isn't as far as it might seem. There's an important question in here around who decides uh, what's effective, what's not effective, governance questions. As we've talked about, Peter, I feel like there are two ditches that Plan C has to steer away from. One is the sort of integrity questions of the carbon markets as they are now. And the other is the kind of governance efficiency um, questions that, 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 you know, have plagued some of the UN uh, wealth transfer uh, investment vehicles that, that, that precede this. So how are you thinking about those questions and, and in particular from a governance and impact perspective? Yeah. I mean, so first of all, and I get to say, how are you thinking about it as if I'm, <laughs> how are we all thinking about it? Yeah. Um, first yeah. of all, it, it's a really, really, really important question. Uh, and I don't, think it's necessarily one that we've got a perfect answer to yet. Um, my initial thought is that it's probably important to decide on some interventions first. And again, I, I don't think sort of within the, the handful of, of those five interventions, even that I listed off, that there would be much debate vis-a-vis -vis whether you do, you know, electricity versus buildings versus transportation. Like, some of it may just be, look, let's let's pick some of these pretty well understood things and, and then begin to move from there. 
Um, I also think, though, that there is probably a real role that could be played for existing actors in the plan A and plan B world to help with that decision making. Um, these are smart people that have been working on this for a long time. So, you know, where should we be directing resources? How do we think about sort of a portfolio which gets rebalanced through time and who could help sit on top of that and make sure that it's happening appropriately? Similarly, you then have to come up with sort of the metrics for intervention. And my, at least in my imagining, and I haven't really talked about this with, with anybody on here yet, um, I imagine that that's really a dialogue between the experts who are responsible for running the platform and the entity that's sort of sitting at the top and thinking about the interventions which with a lot of stakeholder work in between. Um, again, my my sort of fundamental thought on this is that at least inside of platforms where the principal focus is emission reduction, how do you start at first principles, which is like, okay, how do we reduce atmospheric carbon flux? And, you know, to the extent you can measure that, you know, we got all these satellites measuring methane now, like awesome, great. And if not, then we can work backwards from there to just make sure that we're not getting too far into the weeds unnecessarily. Yeah. Um, sometimes we will need to get into the weeds, but I think a lot of times we go really deep into the weeds because we care about attribution and claims and some of these other things at the level of individual companies, whereas at the level of a platform or a jurisdiction, it might matter somewhat less. Great. We're starting to see more questions coming in the chat. I'm going to batch two that I think are great. And Haida, nice to virtually see you. Um, what's the what's the role of claims in the context of Plan C? Are companies making claims? What kind of claims are they making? And then there's a second question here, just again, in the spirit of batching in time. Um, are, is anyone doing this? We've touched on this, I think, from the supply side a little bit, from the demand side. Like, Are there any success stories you could point to? Yeah. Um, so on the claim side, actually, it gets very simple, right? Like plan C, that's now your, I'm a plan C participating company. I have written my check and I am done. And that would ultimately be the claim. So in this framework, at least in an ideal state, net zero as it stands today is gone. Um, now, is that what's likely to happen in reality? Probably not. But that is sort of the vision here is that once the check writing has happened, you are then done with your responsibility to the system because you have paid your fair share. And then efficacy of intervention is evaluated at the level of the platform and it is separated from the corporate responsibility. Can um, I jump in here? Sorry yeah, before we get to the second question because we have a question from Aaron Craig. So it's like a whole Terrapass reunion here. Um, but she's asking an important point, which, and you've touched on this too, Peter, is sort of how, who got Meta into this in the first place, which is who's doing, which I, you don't have to answer, but like, where's the encouragement coming from? Where's the pressure to be part of plans? Net Zero has created its whole ecosystem um, around you're in or you're out. And and so in the plan C construct, how are we thinking about, you know, where, who, what's the forcing function? Yeah. And, and that does tie back to the claim. Yeah. So first of all, Meta is not in the like this is this is started as a guy's idea. And then very graciously, SFI welcomed me into their family to help develop the thinking. But right now, no companies are doing this. What I will say is there are a growing number of companies that recognize the inefficiencies and the problems in the existing system and recognize that there is the potential for new thinking to max to to be impact maximizing. And so I think from a motivation perspective, Plan C actually does two really important things. One, for many companies, it simplifies something that they are plowing a lot of time and money into. And like, yeah, maybe not so great for sort of the sustainability industrial complex, which is spending a lot of time consulting to companies and pitching them tools and all of this stuff. But it simplifies the work for many companies, not all of them, because some of them will choose that sort of itemized deduction approach. And two, it also makes it easier for them to be done once they have written the check. And I think this is something that companies are really concerned about is that the frameworks change, the standards change, uh, some project in rural Brazil that they are involved with but, you know, try as they might through every good and like these aren't ill will things. These aren't quarter cutting things. 
But at the same time, it, it is impossible for companies to fully engage on all of the things they're expected to engage in. And so I think, uh, I think ultimately, once you're once you've written the check, you're done. And I think that that would be very appealing to many companies. Yeah, I want to chime in on the claims uh, piece too, and go back to this sort of itemized standardized. If I can offer a little editorial here. I think the standardizes, write the check and you're done. The itemized gets us, is the bridge back to accounting and claims. I think that's sort of the longer term possibility of where this isn't just a total, complete detour into another parallel universe. It brings us back where you can imagine a claim that is auditable, true, net entity level net zero. So, and whether that's an appropriate goal or not, because what we really need is geological net zero, but but that's sort of a way back um, to some of the, the current practice. We have a hand up and maybe want to, I know. So Liam, you want to jump in here? Yeah, thanks, Peter. You said you wanted to make it a bit more conversational. I thought I'd give it a go. Um, give it I, a go. I'll give it a go. I, I run the climate work at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, and we're a company that's got a net zero target 2040, kind of ambitious. I've modeled lots of scenarios and it's really challenging. I, I've not quite got to the point of it's physically impossible within the, the bounds of the framework, but potentially. And kind of was staring into the abyss of that kind of reality and was kind of, I don't know, a bit put off for a while, but came to the realization that just because we can't do everything straight away doesn't mean we shouldn't do something and kind of got along a similar thought path to the one you were describing during this call. So the idea that I, I was coming up with was electricity is the most material environmental issue for companies like ours, companies like Meta who are buying our stuff. And India is a material market to us in terms of like top 10 that we sell into second most employees outside of the US and um, a grid that's twice as dirty as the US, like one of the dirtiest in out of all the large countries. So if we could spend all the money that we're spending on things like buying wrecks, you know, other kind of voluntary things that we're doing along the lines of our net zero goals, and then put we'll put it pulled that all together just within one company to develop renewables projects in India. That would be the single most effective thing we could do that's material to our business if we're thinking about climate change on a planetary boundary rather than our supply chain and an organization. So I think it's really aligned with what you were talking about. I think you know lots of challenges that I've been thinking about as you've been talking about this, but it would definitely be something that I would be keen to um, I don't know, participate, have some discussion on with you and, and the team. And I, I think yeah, it's more I mean, where, where we'd be interested in. Liam, you know. I love it. And actually, like, I'd push you a step further and say, what if India wasn't, what if you didn't have a nexus to India, but everything you said about it is still true? And so how then do we find ourselves in a circumstance where we just say decarbonizing the electricity grid in India is a planetary priority? And we're going to direct resources from this segment of the economy against that priority. And, you know, again, maybe it's useful because we still live in a plan A and plan B world for the most part to say, OK, India is in your supply chain and it's in the supply chain of a lot of companies. And so for that reason, yeah. we're going to choose India. But I think it's sort of an interesting exercise, at least as a thought exercise, to just ask the question, like, if you didn't have a nexus to India, it still makes sense. It almost certainly makes sense. I, yeah, I mean, I, I choose it because it makes sense and because it's aligned with our business. And I think until you, I think you either have to try and connect it to it's a good thing for business, or you need to be able to convince business as a whole that this is the right thing to do, or this this makes sense. And instead of me signing on lots of procurement contracts that we're going to have a net zero goal and we're going to report to CDP and be 100% renewable energy by 2030 by buying RECs that we don't have to do that because we can have more impact somewhere else. I think those are going to be the kind of challenges that I can think of just right off the bat that we need to work through. Actually, Liam's perspective is a, is, is a great way to inform the final thought, which is that I think people that really care about this inside of companies that are thinking about spending real money or are already spending real money, who aren't cutting corners, who aren't bad actors, who aren't any of these things, 
are asking real questions about how to maximize the impact of their corporate dollars on climate change rather than maximizing the impact of their corporate dollars on reporting standards. And when that is the place that you're coming from, you reach some pretty interesting conclusions that don't really look like the world we live in today. Thank you again, Peter, for joining us today. Uh, it was great talk. And then I'm just like enjoying listening to you. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. And then um, we'll see you next month. Thanks for having me.